Good morning, church. I um, have this bad habit, I guess. It's not really a bad habit, but uh, right now it is because I want to say uh, it's good to see everybody, but uh, there's nobody to see. So uh, uh, Ron is uh, here with me and Greg is here with me, and I can assure you they are sitting uh, six, about six feet maybe apart, maybe a little bit more. And so we are uh, very grateful to, uh, to be able to offer this um, to the congregation and to be able to connect with you in this way. And um, you know that we miss you and we wish that you were here. We wish this building was full and we wish we can hear all the sounds that we would normally hear. But um, for now, this is going to do for us and very grateful for this opportunity that we have to, to reach out in this way. Uh, so we've been, we've been looking at this series on ascension. We're talking about the ascension of Jesus and uh, what that means for us. And so we, we kind of started this uh, series last, um, last week at the resurrection. And so we're going to continue with talking about that and the, in, in the nature of the ascension. But, um, you know, we have this saying in Texas. I was thinking about this um, this week. We have this saying in Texas, and uh, it's, if you don't like the weather... Wait a while and what? It'll change, right? I mean, that's, that, it's funny that we say that because I always heard that growing up and uh, I always think about that. We have this saying, and, and then I moved to Maryland, and guess what? They have the same saying in Maryland. And then I went to Alabama, and they have the same saying in Alabama. And I think every state has the same sayings. We just kind of claim them for our own. But it's true, right? I mean, what we're saying is that change is unavoidable, that it's something's going to change. It doesn't matter how hard we try or what we think, uh, what we can do to try to prevent change, change happens. Uh, and, and it's true. We wait a while and the weather is certainly going to change. And, and I'm sure that like me, um, I had different plans for this year. I had other things that I was thinking about doing and other lessons that I was planning on teaching. And, and those plans have all, have all changed. Things have changed. Things are different now. And so things have changed. And I'm sure that you're in the same situation where you're thinking about things that you were planning on doing for this year, but they have changed. And so it is unavoidable that things change. And in John chapter 20, we see these disciples of Jesus and they had plans. They had hopes. They had dreams. They had expectations. And all of that changed at the cross. Their whole world was turned upside down at the cross. That all the things that they were thinking about doing and all of the, the things that they thought about the kingdom and their position in the kingdom, all of that was, was crushed. All of those hopes, all of those dreams were crushed when Jesus went to the cross. And I think the cross still has that kind of effect on people, doesn't it? When you think about the cross and you think about our plans, your plans, what you were planning on doing with your life, and then you encounter Jesus at the cross and your whole world gets turned upside down. Everything that you thought you were going to do and everything you thought you were going to be, it suddenly changes in light of the cross. And these disciples, that's exactly what they experienced. Their, their thoughts, their, their ideas, their expectations, all of it changed at the cross. Now the chapter begins with Mary Magdalene going to the tomb. Jesus has, has been crucified and he has been buried. And she goes to the tomb early on a Sunday morning. And, you know, what, what do you think she was planning on doing? that morning. What do you think she was planning on doing? What do you think she expected to see when she got to the tomb? Now, I'm certain that it wasn't an empty tomb. That, that was not her expectation when she got up that morning, that she was going to go to the tomb and it was going to be empty. She wasn't expecting to see a resurrected Lord when she made it to the tomb. And in verse 15, verse 15, she encounters a man. If you remember the story in John chapter 20, she encounters this man, and at first she assumes this man to be the gardener, and it turns out to be Jesus. It, 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 it's hard to know. I was trying to put myself in the place of Mary and, and think about what she may have experienced, and it's really hard to know how she felt at that moment. 
And, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking for me, it would have been a mixture of different feelings. I would have felt, um, you know, there may have been a little fear in there, right? I mean, this, this wasn't expected uh, right off the bat. I mean, she, she knew about the resurrection and she had heard about it, but that's not good enough, right? I mean, experiencing it firsthand, here is Jesus alive. That would have brought a bit of fear, I would think. And she probably had a little bit of confusion. And, and I think that most of all, most of all, she would have had a rekindled hope. That, that's what I would have felt. I would have thought at the cross, everything was lost. But at the resurrection, everything is, is back again. It's back on track. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And so there's a, some hope there. Of, of what the future is going to bring. Everything is going to be okay. And maybe, just maybe, their expectations of Jesus being the Messiah, of Jesus being the King, of Jesus coming and sitting on his throne in Jerusalem and ruling and reigning and, and, and conquering Rome and rising up the people, maybe all of this was going to come true. Maybe it was going to happen just like they thought it was going to happen because now here before them is the resurrected Jesus. But then, but then Jesus says in verse 17, he looks at Mary and he says, stop clinging to me. Stop clinging to me. And then he says, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go. Go to my brethren and say to them that I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. See, some translations, when you read that, read, don't touch me, right? And, and there's been so many speculations as to what Jesus meant, you know, about don't touch me. But I, I think the better reading of this is don't continue to hold on to me. And it's kind of like uh, somebody in the military who's stationed overseas coming home on leave and they're with their family for a while. Maybe they're home for a couple of weeks. Maybe they're home for a month. But the family needs to understand that my stay here is, is temporary. I'm here now and enjoy my presence, enjoy being with me, but my stay here is temporary because I have to go back. I have to go back. And that's what Jesus is saying to Mary, that I'm here. It, yes, it's exciting. And yes, it's hopeful. And yes, the future is bright. But I have to return to my father. I have to go back. And so Mary needs to know that she cannot continue holding on to Jesus. She needs to understand that he must ascend to his father. Now that word ascended, just simply means to, to go up. That is very simple. It means to, to go up. In fact, it's used by Matthew when talking about Jesus in his baptism, when he was baptized by, by John. And it's used in the sense that Jesus has come up out of the water. That same word is used in Matthew. And then again in Matthew chapter 5 in verse 1, where it talks about Jesus ascending or going up the mountain to teach. You know, kind of like Moses going up Mount Sinai to receive a message from God. That same kind of word is used, the, the ascension to go up. Now, Luke really picks up on this narrative in uh, Acts chapter 1. So if we want to turn to Acts chapter 1, Luke picks up on the narrative, and he continues this storyline. And, uh, and in verse 3, he says that, Luke does, he says that he, he that is Jesus, presents himself alive after his, after his suffering. And he says that there was many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of things concerning the kingdom of God. So we get an idea. So Jesus is going to spend 40 days with the disciples. He's going to be there for a while. He's talking to them about the kingdom, some things that they wanted to know, so their expectations. And he's informing them of these things. And in verse 6, it says, So when they had come together... They were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? See, they want to know about the political 
kingdom. They want to know about Israel's restoration back to its glory, back to the glory days. And maybe they had David in mind, and they thought, this is what we want. We're hoping that the Messiah is going to bring Israel back to the glory days of David, where we are going to be victorious, where we are going to be a powerful nation again. And maybe that was where they were going with this. It's really hard to say. But that was a common Jewish expectation, and maybe they still had that on their mind and on their heart. But what Jesus is communicating to them is different. It's a little different than what they expected. And, and so what they're going to have to do is wait. And Jesus tells them, you're just going to have to wait here. Stay here in Jerusalem, and I will send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Advocate. He will come, and when he comes, he's going to communicate that to you. It's going to start making more sense. After I go and he comes and I communicate that message to you through the Spirit, it's going to begin to make more sense. And they're going to begin to understand. They're going to begin to understand that Jesus is the King, that he is the one that they have been waiting for. But he's not going to be here on earth, sitting on an earthly throne. He's not going to be in Jerusalem. He's not going to be in Israel. He's going to be in heaven. And he's going to be ruling from there. And he's going to be on his throne next to his father. And so this idea needs to be reshaped in their mind about the nature of the kingdom. God's kingdom. The kingdom that they are part of. In verse 9, it says, And after they had said, he had said these things, he was, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. Remember when Mary went to the empty tomb in John chapter 20, verses 11 and 12? Mary goes to the empty tomb and looks in at one point and sees that there's these, these two angels in white, one of them at the head and one of them at the foot of where Jesus was. Uh, it, the same kind of idea. This, this same kind of imagery is being, is being seen here. We've got these two men dressed in white. Now, I'm not saying they're the same figures. I don't, want, I don't know if they are or not, but the story connects. And so I just want us to see that there's a connection where, there with the story. In verse 11, in verse 11, it says, They also said, these men in white, Men of Galilee, why, why do you stand looking into the sky? So you can kind of imagine what they were doing. They're all standing there. Jesus is just, I mean, he's going up, and, and he gets further and further, and he disappears into the clouds, and they're just looking and, and, and waiting. And once again, these, these angels, these messengers from God, are asking Jesus' disciples a question. Remember, they asked Mary, why are you weeping? And now they're asking these men, why are you standing here looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Jesus, right? Resurrected Jesus, back from the dead, the first fruits of the resurrection. He is literally going up. He is literally ascending into the clouds. And, and you know... If you were to ask anyone, and I think this is really anyone, I mean, even if they, um, regardless of what their background is, you ask somebody, where's heaven? What are they going to do? They, they're going to point up, right? I mean, that's, that's common, right? We always do that. And the scriptures play on that all the time. They always talk about God looking down on earth and, and heaven being up. But we know that if it be possible to just travel up as far as you can go, that you'll never actually physically make it to heaven, right? I mean, we can't just fly up into heaven. Heaven is God's space. That's where he dwells. That's his place. And earth, that's, that's man's space, right? And so we have these two contrasting spaces, God's space and man's space. And so this image is that resurrected Jesus is going from man's space into God's space. And that's, that's what these angels are communicating, that he is ascending into heaven. And, and this really should have reminded these, these Jews 
about a vision that Daniel had in Daniel chapter 7. So if you want to turn to Daniel chapter 7 with me, Daniel has this vision. And all of this should have been, been in their mind as they're watching these things and listening and hearing these things. But the vision is, um, is towards the end of, of a long narrative that we spent some time, time studying. Chapter 1 through 6. If you remember all those great stories of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and their, their faith that they had. And, and towards the end of that, the book suddenly starts shifting into a, an apocalyptic type language, a prophetic language, a revelation where Daniel is taken up and he has given a vision where he sees these, these really bizarre things. He sees chaotic waters and he sees these beasts, like monsters, coming up out of the water. And, and these four beasts have, are, are, are really, I mean, they're, they're very intimidating when you, read, when you read the narrative. But the idea is that this, this, uh, these, these kingdoms and these kings are going to come forward, and they're going to be powerful, and they're going to be, they're going to be evil, and they're going to, to seem undestructible. They're going to, it's going to look like that they're going to be able to consume anything in their path. But then Daniel also has another part of this vision where he sees this, this human, right? This son of man. And, and he's, he's coming up through the clouds. And he comes up before God. And he's presented to God. And so Daniel has this really bizarre vision. Now, if you really want to get into the... Uh, the symbolism of the different beasts the story continues and it tells us that these are kings these are kingdoms and really you just go to Daniel chapter 2 and you really get a good commentary of what he's seeing in this other vision but the point we really want to talk about is the fact that that out through all this during this scene Daniel sees this human who is ascending into the heavenly realm in this vision. So let's pick that up in, in verse 9. In verse 9, it says, I kept looking until thrones were set up. In the ancient of days, that's God, took his seat. And his vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. His we, the wheels were a burning fire. In verse 10, it says, A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. And the court sat, and the books were open. It's, it's, a, it's a holy courtroom, right? It's, it's a heavenly throne room. And these power-hungry, these great beasts... These beasts that came out of the chaotic waters that seemed like they were going to be indestructible. The, these beasts, they're going to be judged. They're going to be judged by the Ancient of Days. And he is going to sit on his throne. He's going to sit in his court. And he's going to judge these kings and these kingdoms. And then in verse 11, it says, Then I kept looking because of the sound of a, the boastful words that which the horn was speaking. And he said, I kept looking until the beasts were slain and its body was devoured and given to the burning fire. And as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. So isn't this amazing? We have this image of something great, something powerful, something that seems that it's going to just encompass everything, and, and there's no way you're going to be able to defeat it. There's no way you're going to be able to conquer it. And anybody who is faced with one of these ugly monsters is just going to be devoured. They don't stand a chance. And then here's God. Right? Here's the Ancient of Days. And he comes up and he sits on his throne and he just, like with the snap of a finger, right? With just a word. And they're, they're destroyed, right? The monster is slain. Their power is taken away. Just like that. But then he grants them this period of time where they could look. It's like they think they're in control, right? They think that they're powerful. They think that they are the ones who are, who are in control. And then God comes around and he says, no, no, I'm in control. I give you your power. I give you your strength. And if I want to take it away, I take it away. If I want to give it to you, I give it to you. But you're not in control. 
And God sits on his throne and he judges these kingdoms. In verse 13, he said, I kept looking in the night vision. This is a continuation of Daniel's vision. He said, I keep looking and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man, a son of Adam, a son of Adam, one, a son of the human family. He says, one like the son of man was, was coming and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. This is like a, a formal presentation, like an offering. You, you see this word used frequently throughout Leviticus and, and, and in regards to the priest and their offering. In verse 14, it says, And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion it is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So this, 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 this Jesus, I mean, that's, that's the image, right? This is Jesus. This is that son of man, the resurrected Jesus, the human representative of both God and man, has been lifted up in the clouds. He has been presented to God. He has been given dominion. He has been given glory. He has been given a kingdom. He has been exalted, right? That's who this is. And so these men, if we go back to the story in Acts chapter 1. We see them looking from the earth, right? And they're looking up and they're watching Jesus ascend into the clouds. Well, Daniel, hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, he sees this vision. And, and he sees from the heavenly perspective this Son of Man coming up through the clouds into the heavenly realm. This human representative coming up and, and sitting on the throne. And, and you see, the thing is that we need to understand is this was God's plan all along. This has always been God's plan. He has been planning to take somebody from the human family, a representative from the human family, and to sit him on a throne as a king. You see, before Jesus came from heaven, right? In the incarnation, and he became man. The word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And then he experienced death and he went to the tomb and he was resurrected, his resurrected body, the first fruits of the resurrection. And now he's going to go from earth into heaven, right? To represent us, to represent the human family. It, it's such a beautiful image, the ascension of Jesus, to, to say that somebody who's walked on this earth, who's lived in this life, who's experienced the fear and pain and agony that can come from reality in this world somebody who is both god and man right somebody who is divine and of a human nature can exist in both realms he can pass from one to the next he is sitting on the throne next to god and he is ruling and he is reigning in that position the ascension of jesus but that's not the end of the story is it I mean, sometimes we think about the ascension of Jesus and we think, well, you know, he just, he died and he was buried and he was raised and he ascended and that's it. It's over. We're just kind of waiting for him to come back. But that's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story at all. In fact, from that point forward, everything's going to change. Everything's going to change. History is going to change because a son of man sits on the throne in heaven, everything is going to be different. Jesus is going to usher in a new era for the human family as the first fruits of the resurrection. He is going to bring many sons to glory. He's going to call us brethren, and he's going to be there with God and represent us as our advocate. Our, as our paraclete. We, we sometimes use that word and often with the Holy Spirit, but Jesus is there. He's our paraclete. He's our advocate. He's sitting there in this holy throne room representing us, the human family. And those of us who have submitted ourselves to his authority, 
Those of us who have been buried with him in the waters of baptism and who have been raised up to walk in this newness of life, those of us who have experienced the resurrection in the present age, those of us who belong to Jesus, we are part of this kingdom. We're part of this new reality. We're part of this, this new, resurrected, recreated human family in the present as we anticipate and look forward to the day that we, like Jesus, come out of the grave and we, like Jesus, are with God in this new reality. And Paul, Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6. After declaring in chapter 1 that we have, we have all transgressed God, we have all sinned, we have all gone our own ways and followed the path of this world, the path of disobedience and destruction, and he says that God's grace has saved us, has rescued us from darkness. And he has raised us up in verse 6. And, and he has seated us. He seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus in the present. We can experience this new reality because someone from our family... Someone who calls us brethren sits on the throne in heaven. So what I want us to do this week and, and the future weeks to come as we continue to unpack the meaning of all of this, you know, I know this is a lot to digest. I know it's a lot to think about. So I want us to just meditate on this. Just meditate on, on Jesus. Just think about the Son of Man, the Son of God, ruling and reigning in heaven. The fact that God has given him, this Son of Man, this Jesus dominion and glory and a kingdom and that all peoples and nations and men and every language serve him. An everlasting dominion that will never pass away. A kingdom which will not be destroyed. And as we continue to look at this topic, we need to come to grips with this. We need to embrace the fact that, that Jesus has ascended, that he has ascended to his Father, to our Father, to, to his God and our God, that Jesus, our Lord and our God and our brother sits on the throne. So it's going to be okay. <laughs> That's, that's the message, right? It's going to be okay. Even though it might look dark for a while and it might look gloomy for a while and, and even this life doesn't always look great, does it? We have times that we are down and, and depressed and we have times that we are afraid and, and we are uncertain and, and our hope has been dashed and our hopes and our dreams and our expectations have been crushed. But the empty tomb... And the ascended Jesus tell us it's going to be okay. So I don't know what situation you're going through, and I don't know what pains you're suffering, and I don't know how all of this has affected you, but just tell yourself that. Just tell yourself that. Tell your wife and tell your kids and tell your, your parents or whoever needs to hear that. It's going to be okay because, because Jesus the Son of God, the Son of Man, sits on His throne. It's going to be okay. Greg is going to come forward and he's going to um, offer our, our communion comments. So if we can just, just meditate on that and think about these ideas as we go through the week. And um, hopefully we will see everybody soon. But until then, uh, this, this is a very good avenue for us to, to continue uh, to reach out. Greg? Good morning, church. I um, <clears throat> wanted to just say to all of you that um, what, a, what a wonderful blessing um, it is to, to just be here this morning. And, and for me personally, it's been uh, a blessing and an encouragement to to just sit here in the auditorium and to see Ron and to see Sean and, and listen to Sean preach. There's that familiarity and that 
um, that, that uh, family uh, nature that, that, that is so nice uh, to, to experience again. Of course, what's missing is, is all of the rest of the family, and I'm really, really looking forward to the time that we're all back together again and we can look around and, and, um, and, and speak to one another and encourage one another. I was thinking as I came up, I can't wait to, to see uh, Merle Miller uh, welcoming people coming into the building and uh, see uh, folks visiting and laughing and enjoying each other's company. I miss seeing uh, Jeff Ennis giving Joyce Crabtree a hard time and Joyce giving it back, the, that, that uh, uh, good uh, relationship that we have with each other. And so um, this is a difficult time, but, but this will pass and, and we will uh, be together again physically. Uh, we are together spiritually. We'll be together again uh, physically soon. And so um, keep those things in mind. You know, as Sean was talking this morning about change, uh, how things change in our lives, and, and yet while they change, uh, there are constants uh, which remain the same, which do not change. And I was thinking about that as I was um, thinking about our uh, communion time this morning and remembering the death of Jesus. And, and you know, um, when people are going through trauma and difficult times in their lives, one, one of the most effective things that they can do is to think about those things in their lives which are not changing. Uh, we, we do this with, for example, children in the school system when their parents are getting divorced or their problems in the family. Try to help them remember and think about those things that, are, uh, that have not changed in their lives, that there are things that continue uh, to be true and to be uh, solid. Uh, folks as adults go through trauma and uh, difficult times in life, and it's important to remember those things which have not changed. And, and that's uh, similar to what Sean was talking about this morning. We're, we're, in the, we're in a time right now when things have changed a great deal, and uh, that's, that's traumatic for us. It is, it is, a, it is a form of trauma uh, that we're going through. And it's important for us, especially important for us as Christians, to remember, as Sean talked about, to remember these things that have not changed uh, in, in our Lord and in his position uh, and in his uh, advocacy for us and in our place with the Father because of him. And, and that's really what we're doing in the communion. That's what we're doing as we observe the, the Lord's Supper is we're remembering that sacrifice of Jesus, that gift that he made, that offering that he made on our behalf, um, which does not change. Uh, the fact of the offering or the sacrifice will never change, and the meaning of the sacrifice will never change. It is what makes our relationship with God uh, not only possible, but a reality because of the forgiveness that we have. If you have uh, bread and fruit of the vine available, uh, at this time, we're going to um, offer a, a prayer, a couple of prayers uh, for those elements, thanking God for those elements, um, and remembering Jesus' death. And so if you have uh, that bread available uh, to you, um, we'll begin there. Before I pray, though, I want to read uh, from Matthew chapter 26, very familiar verse uh, or, or a couple of verses where Jesus instituted uh, this uh, memorial that we observe each uh, Sunday, each first day of the week. In Matthew 26, beginning in verse 26, we read this. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Jesus began a memorial um, and identified these elements, which would represent his body and his blood and would help us to remember, help us to observe and to think about and meditate upon this sacrifice that he made. So if you have that bread available, 
Uh, we're going to pray now and then uh, would encourage you uh, to partake of it if you would pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your care. We thank you for the confidence that um, you do not change, that your word does not change, that your plan does not change, that our Lord uh, does not change, that uh, you and he are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Father, as we uh, partake of this bread, we simply um, want to say to you, thank you. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for the plan for Jesus' sacrifice. We're grateful for his submission to that plan. And we're grateful for the opportunity to remember it uh, in this uh, time of communion. Thank you for this bread, which does represent his body. And all these things, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have uh, fruit of the vine, if you have uh, some juice uh, available to you, then um, we'd like now to um, offer a prayer uh, and partake of that as we think of the blood that was shed uh, by Jesus on our behalf. Would you pray with me again? Our Father in heaven, we continue uh, to think about the sacrifice of Jesus. We continue to uh, be grateful for this tremendous gift that was given to us, this tremendous offering made on our behalf. Uh, thank you, Father, again for the plan, for the offering itself, and thank you for the opportunity to remember it as we observe this communion. Thank you for this cup, which reminds us, as we see in the scriptures, reminds us of the blood that Jesus shed that we might have forgiveness of sins. Father, help us to be grateful and to think about his sacrifice as we partake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll bow with me, we will dismiss. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to know that you loved us and you cared for us and you had a plan. Father, in these trying times, help us to remember that as long as we have you, things will be okay. Father, we just ask you to be with those that have been ministering to the various people that have been stricken. Help us to remember them and their dedication. Help us to remember that we need to give our support we need to be thankful that they're willing to serve in that way and manner. Father, we as Christians need to reach out in various ways to others to let them know we care, we're concerned, and help us to be more Christ-like in our lives. Father, everything we have comes through you. Help us to remember your majesty and your glory and that through you all things are possible. Father, we just ask you to help us to encourage one another to get through these times. Help us to take this time to study your word, to be willing to share with others the good news. Father, we ask you to be with the leaders of our country, 
and the leaders of the world help them make decisions that support your honor and your glory. Father, we just ask you to help us all to be humble and to remember that we are nothing without you. Father, we just ask you to help us throughout this week. Help us to reach out to others in various ways to let them know we're concerned, we care, and that we're all striving to get home to you. Father, we know we're human and we're weak and we stumble and at times we sorely disappoint you. We beg your forgiveness. We ask you to be with us all. In Jesus' name we pray.